Thank you. And thanks for the organizers to inviting us to share our thoughts and our um, research on these areas. Um, certainly, I come from Colombia. I come from the tropics, as has been said here. I, I part of they, the, the developing country people. And, um, and we have done, um, we have certainly a perspective on, 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 on what can be done or the challenge that we face, particularly when it comes to uh, small plantations as small coffee growers. So let me just start by saying, uh, to, to, to tell you a little bit uh, who we are and what's, uh, what we're trying to do on these aspects. Just a little glance at Colombian coffee, we have over half a million Colombian coffee growers, uh, and they grow coffee in a little bit more than 900,000 hectares. You make the division, it's 1.6 on average, what we have of hectares per grower. Uh, so that gives you now the scale of, of the problem. Uh, and this is certainly not unique to Colombia and to coffee, uh, many other producers in, in many other countries, as, as was mentioned before, face sort of similar scale situations. Um, but it's even worse because you were to distribute that, um, uh, you know, of nearly 300,000 have less than one hectare. So you can imagine now the, the transaction costs and the verification costs associated with carbon footprinting. Now a little bit about who we are. Uh, we have uh, we are the a growers based organization. We are a non for profit uh, organization, and uh, the growers elect the officials that direct our budgets and direct our, um, our you know their priorities. So I am an employee of the Colombian Coffee Growers Federation, which is a guild to represent them. Uh, a little bit about the scale of the organization. Uh, last year, we invested in sustainability programs nearly $360 million, $370 million, uh, a little bit more than $1 million per day in farm productivity, environmental uh, research and uh, uh, programs, community programs and connectivity programs, as we uh, call them. Uh, a little bit of what we do in, in, in terms of advocacy, in terms of social and technical investment. We have a, a fairly sophisticated research center, uh, probably the most uh, sophisticated in coffee agronomics in, in the world. Uh, I think Nestle has a very good center. Brazil, in Brazil, they, have, they do very good coffee research, but I, we, we think that we do as well. And uh, we do a lot of, uh, and, and it's called Seni Cafe, and this is mo most of the figures that I'm going to talk uh, about are coming from, from our research center. And probably the last thing on the descript of the descriptive nature is uh, how we keep track of coffee growers and coffee growers' plantation. We have a fairly large uh, database of coffee growers. Each, each coffee farm is geo-referenced and each coffee farm has, is divided into different lots, and each lot has the, the variety which it is planted, the density at which it is planted, and the age at which it is planted. So we, have, we, we sort of can correlate and make the low large numbers uh, probably work for carbon footprinting. That, that's, that's something that I'm going to try to share with you, but uh, this, is, this database is very crucial for, for that. Okay, now a little bit more about climate change. We have already been affected by climate change. We have had more diseases. We have uh, reduced yields in, in coffee, uh, changed in precipitation patterns, changed in uh, flowering uh, seasons. Uh, so we are already struggling with, with that. Uh, and also the, the uh, more... Um, the, the higher temperatures also tend to take away coffee from the lowlands. So, uh, when I talk lowlands, I'm talking about coffee plantations between 1,000 and 1,200 meters approx, uh, which mostly go to beef, 
they, 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 they become, you know, they, they cease to be coffee plantation and they become uh, more of, on, on beef or, or cattle, if, uh, if you will. Uh, I don't have anything against beef, but you know that what that means in, in terms of carbon footprint. Um, our priority, however, is sustainability for coffee growers. And, uh, and uh, in terms of adaptation, uh, we, are, we are finalizing or working to finalize the coffee genome and finding the genes that will help us develop the varieties that are resistant or can adapt better to, to climate change. And that's, that's why we do functional genomics studies at Sunny Cafe, and we do a lot of work on genetic diversity for Arabica species so that we can find what's, what varieties can adapt better to change in precipitation regimes or change in temperatures or both. It's, uh, I, I, I dare say that we face not one climate change, but many climate changes within Colombia. And we, uh, uh, and we have to figure out or correlate indicators of climate change with indicators of, of, of what varieties are best for particular regions. Um, okay. Now, let's go to the topic, challenges of a scale. Um, let us start saying that we have worked a lot in trying to improve sustainability standards for Colombian coffee farming. Uh, as of uh, last year, we had over 100,000 coffee growers following one or many codes. Uh, uh, we have different codes. I think Rainforest Alliance was mentioned yesterday. Uh, it's actually not the most popular in Colombia because it is rather restricted to certain particular regions. But we have other, including fair trade, including, you know, you name it. Uh, it's, um, these are codes that we have followed, but sometimes they adapt. Um, they, they, they may be good for, for particular environmental offers, but, but not so good for others. Uh, so, I mean, we are, in short, we are struggling with that. Uh, we, we, we don't uh, really know what's, what's going to happen next. And the cost of keeping track of that is, is quite difficult. You look at, I don't know if you can see, but uh, some of these codes require that you follow over 500 indicators. And uh, you multiply that for 100,000 growers, and uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a complex. And um, so, so, so I guess the previous speaker was very clear as to, you know, the differences and the complexities that you face in, in certain areas and the difficulties to generalize that, you know, the least developed countries or less developed countries are all equal, or that they all come from the tropics and they are all, you know, but it's, you know, the differences can be substantial uh, even within countries. Um, my next slide uh, summarizes that. I mean, there is no one size fits all certification process. And probably there is no one size fits all uh, carbon footprinting measurement for coffee. Uh, and that's something that uh, I would like you to, to think about. And the costs of certification can be substantial for individual growers. And we face sometimes the pressure of clients that require certification it becomes a really a market access issue for, for, for many growers, but at the same time, um, they push the certification costs into the growers. So, so that's uh, yet another reason to, to struggle with that. Okay, now if you were to talk about carbon markets and carbon, you know, how can you get those incentives back to growers? Well, you face yet, you know, more difficulties. Uh, well, you have to make long-term commitments. And the individual grower has to make a commitment for, yeah, I guess, 5, 10, 15 years. A coffee plantation may, take, uh, may, may, may be productive for up to 15 to 20 years. Um, and the question is, uh, who is going to take the credit risk of the growing defaulting on its commitments? Uh, 
because growers are people and they sell their farms, they inherit uh, to their to their children. They, I mean, many things can happen in 20 years. And, and, and then what's, who is going to absorb or take up the credit risk, if you will, of, of that possible default in commitments? It's, uh, it's something to think about. The other thing is, uh, well, the cost of, I mean, you has already mentioned the cost of um, verification and the market access topics. Um, we have developed some research to, to improve, of course, the, the standards of, on the carbon, uh, to reduce the carbon emissions associated with drying coffee, with using less water, to using digesters and biogas storage and, and what have you. But uh, as was mentioned before, they work better for the larger growers. For the smaller growers, it's a lot more difficult to make that cost-benefit analysis work, and that's something that we are working with, and probably with Seco, we can do something creative about. Okay, uh, how am I doing on time? Good? Okay, so, um, now, the question is carbon assessment opportunities. We are, as has been mentioned here before yesterday and today, overwhelmed with the number of seals. Thanks, but no thanks. No more, please. And, um, and we, have, uh, we have had uh, uh, even, you know, it was mentioned, I think, by the gentleman from Nestle, the situation where they tell us what our carbon footprint is without even asking us. Uh, so there was a client from Australia the other day that uh, bought coffee, and they already and he asked us to put on the on the label, you know, the complete uh, carbon footprint of our own coffee that we produce, and we did, you know, we freeze dried ourselves in our own plant and everything else, and um, but he already had figured that out and. Uh, he never crossed the Pacific, so we didn't really understand that. Um, the, so we have the, started doing our own research on this. Uh, we, from, from the plant, from the coffee plantation, including the export process, including uh, we run a, a, a small coffee shop uh, chain that is called the Juan Valdez Coffee uh, Chain. And we also have, a, as I mentioned, a freeze-drying facility. So we, did, we started measuring it from, if you will, from a life cycle perspective. I mean, from, from the seed all the way to the cup in the different facets in which we are involved in the coffee trade. And, um, and uh, trying to make that comparable or adjustable under ISO standards. That's, that's sort of what we have started. And actually, we started like five years ago in, in this area, and we started two years ago in these two areas. This, this is already finished. This is, is still under, under development. Um, one good thing, or one thing that I want to, to, to bring your attention to is that someone at some point decided that uh, coffee trees were not trees, but bushes. And uh, to give you an idea, we are uh, planning to renovate 130,000 hectares in coffee this year. That, that equates to nearly 700 million coffee trees. And, the, and those don't count, because the photosynthesis for, for bushes don't count. So they, they, they count the trees, but they count the bushes. And, and that's really tough to explain to a coffee grower. That's really tough to tell them that their, the photosynthesis of their own plants don't work, that they have to plant these other plants, uh, which actually reduce their productivity. Uh, we never, nevertheless measure the carbon intake of coffee plants according to the particular geographic uh, place where they grow. Uh, we find variations in coffee plants if they grow in... Um, uh, yeah, at different altitudes, if they grow at different latitudes, uh, and different, of course, exp exp exposition to the sun and so on. So, so these, we model that to figure out the differences. Uh, so there is what no single barley, there is no one single coffee, if you will. You, you, you really have to go, and this 
mix it with our database that I mentioned at the beginning, sort of allows us to think about the law of big numbers. We can correlate the database of plantations with the database of, of, of finding out the different variations in, in coffee um, intake or carbon intake, and then we can do that. We did this for, uh, for uh, of course, to do mitigation uh, strategies. Uh, together with some other uh, technologies that I mentioned. Uh, we did this for uh, a number of species. Uh, I think that we have, uh, what is it, nearly 20 to four, uh, or 18 species that we did this mo mo modulation for. And uh, this is how we did it. I mean, over the years, we actually covered uh, the species in one in the tent, and uh, and we were able to sort of uh, measure that uh, and geo-referenced it uh, so that we could uh, figure the differences according to the species, according to the location, and so on and so forth, and come up with numbers that could be usable for this type of uh, models. Anyway, uh, that's, um, that's something that we believe uh, it's something to think about uh, that will take us to a possible NAMA type of uh, situation where we can sort of adapt the sectorial and the country specific uh, 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 appropriated uh, mitigation uh, actions uh, uh, with coffee. That's sort of what we are thinking of moving in terms of moving forward. The advantage that we have is that we have an organization that can have the sort of the support, the technical services, and the expertise to make this law of big numbers work. And I think that uh, with that, I thank you for your attention, and I hope I wasn't too late. Thank you.